So um, what we're going to do is move on to a panel discussion now. So um, as I introduce the panel, they might take their seats up here. So um, first of all, we've got Professor James O'Higgins-Norman. Um, James holds the UNESCO Chair on Tackling Bullying in Schools and Cyberspace at Dublin City University. He's the Director of the National Anti-Bullying Research and Resource Centre and a member of the Government of Ireland Advisory Council on Online Safety. So you're very welcome, James. Thank you. Sonia... <laughs> Uh, then we've got Sonia Ryan. Sonia Ryan is a parent from Corpus Christi National School in Moy Ross in Limerick. And you'll remember I referred to this school um, as, as being a school that had developed its own mental health services on, on campus um, due to the, to the needs within the school. And a lot of those um, development of those services actually mirror what has been developed in the UK. So it's really useful, I think, to hear an Irish example of, of it actually happening in the school. But as well as Sonia being a parent um, of a child in that school she's also on the National Parents Council's uh, board of directors so she she wears two hats today <laughs> and just referring back to our partnership with the INTO today we've also got John Boyle who's the general secretary for the Irish National Teachers Organization um, John hails from Donegal in the Gales Hucked area I think I pronounced that okay, did I, for an English person? <laughs> um, I'm not going to do where, the name of your school very well, though, so I'll leave that. But he worked in um, Ballyboden in a Deshband 1 school for 14 years and then worked as principal teacher in um, a junior school in Knock Line for 18 years. So you're very welcome, John. And finally, but not least, is, the, is Louise O'Leary, who's the Advocacy Manager for St. Patrick's Mental Health Services. And again, you'll hopefully remember that I said that we've got this um, campaign for getting uh, mental health support teams in schools, and that campaign was started in partnership with St. Patrick's Mental Health Services. So uh, Louise is, um, a speci has special interests and related skills in mental health advocacy, women's mental health, and health literacy. Um, she's extensive clinical experience of over 13 years in acute mental health care and community-based services. So that's the panel. Now, you can hear me. Oh, it's a bit of an echo there. I'll keep going and hopefully somebody will sort it. Um, so I'm going to um, just ask all the panel to, to begin with that maybe after reflecting on the two um, speakers that you've heard this morning, both Coleman and Sarah, what are your first impressions taking in all of that information, which I know was an awful lot, but what are your first impressions from that? And I might start with Louise, if that's okay. Hi everyone. Uh, as Sarah was saying, it's really nice to be in a room, also a bit overwhelming, in a room with more than two people. Um, so yeah, I really enjoyed both the presentations. I found myself nodding vigorously along, especially to uh, Coleman um, in, in terms of, uh, and I know Sarah echoed a lot of them as well, but in terms of the importance of not pathologizing children's mental health experiences and recognizing um, the normalcy of experiencing a breath of emotions and that being part of, of, of being human. Um, and I think the, you know, we've referenced the pandemic um, and also children's reaction to the climate crisis. Um, anxiety in those situations are, are normal responses to abnormal events. Um, so I, I really related to that. Um, and sorry, I, t I was taking notes diligently as, as we went and um, something else that really stood out um, from Coleman's points, that was really evidenced then by the outcomes of, of Sarah's presentation was uh, the, the crucial nature of early intervention uh, and how we're, we're getting it wrong by not investing upstream and meeting children where they're at earlier. Um, and uh, another point which reminded me of, of something from a, a very good UNICEF um, report from last year, they do an annual State of the World's children report and for the first time in 2021 it focused specifically on mental health and that was uh, in response to the impacts of the pandemic but they talked about the need to lift mental health supports for children and young people out of the silo of of the health sector um, and meet children where they're at and engage that um, 
cross-system and, and interagency approaches that um, Coleman and Sarah so eloquently explained. So there are some of my rambling thoughts. Thank you very much, Louise. I might pass it to Tate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anya. And it's nice to be here with everyone um, today. Gosh, there was just so much to think about um, from the two amazing presentations that uh, we had today. I'd like to take some ownership because Coleman is a former student of mine in a, in a, in a, in a, in a different light. And I'd like to say I'm not that much older than him, but I was very young at the time. <laughs> but anyway, well done, Coleman. It's lovely to see you here today. And Sarah, you're very welcome as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think the guys have covered this really well. And I think the core point for me in terms of mental health um, and, and children and young people is to do with the culture of our schools and the culture of the teaching profession and the culture of parenting in Ireland as it is today. Coleman described it really well there um, for us. And, and I think the, that culture is inhibiting us having an, an, an impactful response um, around mental health. I mean, my own area of research is bullying, school bullying, cyber bullying, online safety. And, um, uh, it, you know, we, we know from the research that most children who are bullied at school um, respond, uh, will, will recover and, you know, pretty much move on with their life pretty soon after the occurrence happens if it's dealt with in a very uh, efficient, quick, responsive way and if they get appropriate, resp appropriate care from parents and family and so on. It goes back to the resilience point that, was, that Coleman was making earlier on. Um, <clears throat> but when you put the layers of culture into a situation like that and the way that teachers tend to respond to, and I, I work in DCU, the largest teacher education college in the country, so I take some ownership of, of the problem of the culture of the teaching profession. The way teachers respond, the way parents respond in the bullying situation alone um, can often escalate the problem into a space where you know, the truth is lost, mental health issues will get worse, and um, the child is very left very unhappy. So I'd love to come back to that whole thing of, of the relationship between mental health uh, among children and young people and the culture of parenting and teaching in Ireland, which I think is, is something we need to look at seriously. Excellent. Thanks, James. Sylvia. Um, coming from the parental view, I can relate 100% to what Coleman was saying but about being push from pillar to post with behavioural issues, social issues, um, go to CAMS, it's ADHD, go here, it's this. Um, my eldest boy is 11 and he was diagnosed with Asperger's at the age of six. But before that, it was always ADHD, ADHD, go to CAMS, go to CAMS. And at the time, he was too young to be seen. Um, so I was just getting pushed from pillar to post and everywhere in between. But thankfully in his school they had started up a new programme in 2015 called the Sky is the Limit programme where a clinical psychologist from the University of Limerick would come in and do a parenting support group, like Sarah said, with parents um, discussing their children's behaviours and learning, teaching the parents ways on how to cope with them so that what it wasn't becoming a conflict between kids, parents, teachers and everyone else involved because I found with my son that it was becoming an argument between me and him because I didn't know how to cope with his challenges and he didn't know how to cope with them either. So we started that um, within the school and that was really the foundation of the programme with us and it was then that the nail was hitting the head and it was like, you don't need cams. So I was pointed in the right direction by the school on where to go. So that's my story and that's how I can see Coleman's side of it and Sarah's side of it, that the needs are there and this is how you help the needs. That's perfect, thank you. And um, John. Um, thanks very much for inviting us, Anya, and it's really brilliant for us as an organisation to be collaborating with the NPC on this important topic. I, I suppose to answer the question, um, I felt that uh, Coleman um, was the dreamer or the visionary, and um, that Sarah brought the vision to reality, and that's a job that I have as the leader of the teachers union because we have dreams for um, children in schools and we, we have to try to bring them to reality. 
Um, the difficulty we face, and, and I, I do accept the point about the culture, and I know Lucina Clinic, and I know the difficulties that were there in the South Dublin area when Lucina Clinic was established. Um, we found it very supportive when I was principal and when I worked in the Jesh Band 1 school. We saw the clinic develop over time. And I, I know that initially there was a lot of cultural difficulties. And even the clinic itself, when it was established, um, for a long time found it, um, I suppose, a bit daunting maybe to actually talk to teachers. Um, you know, it was very parent-based and obviously that's important because the children are with you in the home for most of the year, even though we do have the longest teaching hours in Europe in Irish primary education, in primary. Um, but they're only in school for 910 hours in the, in the year. So eventually I think the clinic started talking more to, to teachers and that was important. Um, but I, I think that uh, you know, there's certain commonality between the two presentations. The, the fact that Coleman spoke about the beautiful scaffolding that takes place in Irish primary education, that was nice for me to hear. Uh, and then we know the difficulties that we have for children that are transitioning to post-primary and how um, that's not really supported by government. Um, in fact, Irish primary education is not supported at all by government when it comes to children's mental health. There isn't one penny spent, not one cent, spent on children's mental health by the Department of Education for the primary sector. Um, obviously, the fact that we heard so much about the importance of integration of services, um, I find it really difficult to influence, despite my best efforts in our organisation, to influence the Department of Health. Um, to influence the Department of Children. Uh, they don't really talk to us that much, um, but we do have influence on the Department of Education. And that's why for this year, one of the topics that we've prioritised in our pre-budget submission that's going to be launched on Wednesday is children's mental health. And we're not looking for all the bells and whistles that uh, Sarah was able to outline. We're just simply looking for 20 euro per child to deal with children's mental health. It comes to 11 million. Um, and the reason we're looking for it is because we want to get something into the school that can eventually, maybe, you know, small acorns, um, that can eventually grow into the oak tree that we're seeing in southwest England. Um, that scheme there looked after nearly as many children as we have in Irish primary schools. We only have 540,000 children. They looked after nearly 440,000, and it's only in its infancy. Um, so we, we would love to see that the Department of Education would take this on. I mean, it is their responsibility, children's education, and you know, you're not going to learn to your optimum if you're being stymied because you're having children uh, mental health difficulties. Um, that could be easily, easily dealt with. So I thought that the scheme that we have in, that we heard about in England is obviously an absolutely amazing scheme. Um, when you see what happened in My Ross, or when you see the programme that we had from uh, Belfast, from Holy Cross, uh, Young Plato on RTE on Thursday night, Irish schools, the teachers want to do their absolute best for the children. They want to try to, you know, they're, they're just grappling with trying to find some programme somewhere, whether it's, in my case, way back years ago, from Bristol, from uh, Adrian, Dr. Adrian Smith, who came over to our school. In my more recent school, um, the Incredible Years programme, I had to break every rule in the book for those programmes to come into our school. I had to use department money to get substitute teachers so that the teachers would get a proper training program inside in the library. And it was so successful that loads of other schools started freeing up their, their teachers. Now, they didn't want the children to, to be going without a teacher that day, so that this program could become embedded in their school. The department didn't pay any money for that, other than the fact that we, we had to use um, the capitation grants. Now, most schools can't do that, but those schools like my Ross, um, they sh it shouldn't be left to them to be able to make it up or to be able to copy some programme from the USA or from Bristol. 
the Department of Education should be providing these programmes. Thanks very much, John. Um, I go to question two, which is, the, which is an individual question for each speaker. So, James, um, the focus of all of your work and research, as, you, as you've mentioned, is bullying. Um, with this in mind, what is your interest in young children's mental health and in particular mental health supports in primary school? And you might also consider um, and comment on what you believe the impact of a service like we've just heard about from the UK this morning could have on bullying in primary schools. Yeah, thanks, Anya. Um, from the point of view of school bullying in primary schools and in post-primary schools, um, you know, there, there is a lot of emphasis these days on STEM and numeracy and literacy and all of these, uh, you know, things that are important. But unless a child feels safe and well, they are not going to be able to engage in those things. So the issue of school bullying touches on something really fundamental uh, in relation to the well-being and the mental health of children in schools. Uh, we know from our research that even if well, there are obviously there can obviously be long-term effects for somebody who's targeted um, for school bullying, and um, you know when we say school bullying, we include cyber bullying. Um, you know the majority of cyber bullying actually is related to offline bullying. Um, only 1% of those who are bullied are bullied online alone. So it's um, something that can be tackled in the school. And um, if, if we don't tackle it, we know long-term children can begin to stop coming to school, they can have self-esteem issues, they can feel alienated from their community. It can have a lifetime effect on the child who's targeted. But it also can have a lifetime effect on the child who engages in bullying, um, and we also have a duty of care to, the, to them, which is something parents often forget <coughs> Excuse me, when they are um, coming to a school and they want the school to do something um, about their child who's being bullied, that the school will have a duty of care to both children involved. But that child who's, who's engaging in bullying behaviour may be doing it for all kinds of reasons, and they can be individual, family, societal, whatever it might be. Again, the long-term effect on that child's mental health can be quite serious. And then even there, there's research now that shows that those who witness bullying or are aware of bullying um, can have long-term effects as well. They can carry a guilt with them for life because they weren't able to, they didn't have the skills maybe, and they weren't able to intervene or get involved. Some research even compares that, the effect on, on those bystanders um, to post-traumatic stress disorder um, later in life, and uh, there's research to, to show that now. So in terms of mental health, um, Anything that um, can be that can help towards preventing and intervening uh, in relation to bullying is really important. And this initiative that we've been um, learning about today from the UK, I think, can, can actually make a really big impact there, particularly the EMHPs. Um, I'd love to learn more about those because often we find that um, the school teacher can be so focused on delivering the, 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 um, what they have to do, get, getting the kids through the curriculum and so on or whatever. And it's often a caretaker or school secretary, an SNA or a classroom assistant who picks up on, a, on an issue. So imagine if that was formalized into a role um, like an EMHP that could be, in, could be available to schools and could come in with initial response, but also the preventative set part as well is really important. The research shows that uh, females are more likely to have mental health issues as a result of bullying, but also boys who have poorer friendship, um, quality of friendship, will also be more negatively affected. And also, if there has been previous experience in bullying and cyberbullying, um, then the mental health effects can be worse. That's just research we've done in DCU. So, um, so I think from a mental health point of view, this is really important. And the initiative from the UK is very positive, particularly in, re in relation to the uh, EMHPs. And I'm putting you a bit on the spot now, but yeah. when you're talking about research, the fact that it's school-based rather than leaving the school, is there, do you have any views around that, the, mm -hmm. the fact that these services would be in the school? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's really important because the school is, a, is like a locus of the whole, child's whole life. Um, Everybody who's involved in the child's life comes through the school in one form or another, the parent, the teacher, these are really important, their friends, their community, everybody is linked. Our schools aren't just about uh, learning the three hours, it's, it's where a child's life 
flourishes hopefully and um, so so the supports that can be put in place there are really important because they can be linked to all that knowledge that's there about that child and about the community and what's going on there um, we, we I worked when I was a teacher in Kilinardon Community School in Tala and um, it was a Desh Band 2 I think um, school and we did we did um, play a role in the community that was way beyond anything the department would have envisaged or anyone else because um, that's the place, that's, everything is filtered through the, the school that's connected to the child's life. So I think having this kind of service in the school will, will have the maximum impact. And, and that's, sorry just to tease this out a bit, that's really interesting that you raise that knowledge of the community because Sarah has quite rightly said actually the attendance improves so yeah. much because it's in the school, but it has more benefits than just increased attendance. Yes. It's the knowledge that school community has of the child and the family as yeah. well. Yeah, it's all filtered through the school and probably the, cl the, the class teacher. Um, and so I think that the school is definitely the place for this to, for this to happen. Um, I had something else I was going to say there, but I've lost my train of thought, so that's we'll, okay. We'll come back to you. That's yeah. okay. Okay, um, John, uh, central to the, to the programmes in the UK, as outlined by Sarah this morning, is the child. However, it acknowledges that for children to benefit, the whole school community needs to be involved and supported. How do you think this applies in the Irish primary school sector? Well, I think we, like when we advocate for uh, children as learners, we're always emphasising that the optimum learning can be achieved where the conditions are right. Um, and that's not only the learning inside in the school and the school building and, and all the infrastructure, but obviously, as I mentioned earlier, the fact that children are at home and living in their community. So um, the ready, readiness to learn is really, really important. And both speakers mentioned the early intervention. So that's really key. So, you know, any of those documentaries like the one I referred to there uh, from Belfast the other night, you know, you, you can see that the the programme that's been implemented, the key aspect of it is that it's not just something happening behind closed doors inside in the classroom. There's a whole school approach, and a whole school approach includes the parents, it includes all of the different agencies that are available in the community. Now, obviously, um, in Coleman's presentation, he mentioned, you know, the kind of utopia that exists in some communities. Now, they do tend to be, um, I suppose, what are known as disadvantaged communities, but you do have a situation in some communities where there's quite a lot of services available locally, and then you have other communities where there's none at all, there's literally none, like family resource centres. There's only such a small number of those in Ireland, and they tend to be in, in, in uh, the Jesh areas. So it's really, really important that um, if we're running a programme like this, um, I think, first of all, the early intervention is key that would begin in a primary school. But it's, all, it's also really important that the benefits of the programme then are carried through into post-primary and even into third level. And I think the preschools have to be um, factored into this as well because we're finding, um, you know, if one quarter of the children um, are having anxiety and concern like that, I'm sure some of them are having it when they're before school as well. So there needs to be all that joined up approach. Um, I mean, I, I thought the, the, the mental health clinical leads um, would be a very important thing within a school. Uh, over the last, I suppose, 14 or 15 years, uh, the assistant principals in schools were stripped out by uh, the government. They had a moratorium on promotions. Um, it costs about €4,007 Euro to, um, to, to give... Um, a promotion to an assistant principal in a school and in our pre-budget submission again that I mentioned here we're looking for those to be restored. Now obviously one of the key roles that a, an assistant principal could have would be coordinator of special education. Uh, it's amazing that we have Senkos up in the north and in England but we don't have them here because we have a moratorium on promotions. Um, now, some teachers do it for free, and that's fine, but I think um, being promoted into the role and getting a bit of training. So equally, I think that mental health lead would be would be something that every school would should have, you know. So to answer the question, yeah, a multi, a, a cross-community approach would, would be the way to, to deliver um, the best outcomes for children when it comes to looking after their mental health. Um, I, do, I do think that one of the unfortunate situations we have here in Ireland um, is the size of the classes. Um, I mean, um, 
the average has reduced fairly dramatically over the last two, two budgets, and that has to be acknowledged. But we're still the highest uh, class sizes in the Eurozone. We're not quite as high as England, but we're nearly as high. Um, but we, we have very high class sizes. And, you know, when, when you look at the, the beauty of the Jesh Band 1 programme, the Jesh Band 1 programme and the Breaking the Cycle programme that came in in the 1980s, that was based on having um, 15 or 20 children in a class, which is actually the European average. So I think that um, the cross-community approach is important, but magic can happen inside in a classroom. It's amazing what you can get done in those six hours. And obviously the less children, um, if you have 30 children, you could have seven or eight children who have huge anxiety. But if you have only 20 children like the rest of Europe, then there's only five who need that support. So I think every time you hear INTO talking in the media over the next month, a couple of months before the budget, we'll be talking about class sizes. We'll be talking about getting the post responsibility so we can get the mental health leads. We'll be talking about funding for schools so that you, the parents of Ireland, don't have to spend 46 million every year supporting the school system in primary. And this year we're going to be talking about children's mental health. I might just um, explore a little bit more with you, John, on that. Just uh, in terms of the whole school community, I mean, one of the things that, that we've been working on recently is that for, for teachers to support children's mental health, their own mental health needs to be supported too. And that seems to be a key feature of the UK model as well. Um, do you think that something like the UK model would be an important part of that for teachers? I think it would, Diane, and I think it would be very important for parents as well. Um, I don't think any of these programmes will will work if the training that's provided and the supports that are provided are only for the people delivering it in the school. Um, so certainly, yes, the training you know that I mentioned that we had to come up with sort of uh, unusual ways to make sure that the staff got the training. Um, but a key part of, of any programme that I was involved in su successfully in school was that the parents were very, very key to the programme. Um, obviously, having an introductory seminar uh, for parents at night time, most usually when they'd be home from work, would be important, but it shouldn't stop there. So bringing the parents into the school to help with the delivery of the programme or to help support the programme or to help any uh, initiatives around the programme, because you know, as well as what's happening in the classroom, a lot of this work on mental health can happen outside the classroom at the school sports that Coleman was mentioning or on school excursions or um, in, in uh, concerts or whatnot. And if you have if you have parents and teachers working to get together at work, it breaks down a lot of the old traditional barriers that were there. I mean, I know a lot of young parents here, but there would be some people here present who never set foot in a school um, as an adult. The only time they were ever in school was when they were there as a pupil. But nowadays, we find that there's far more involvement of parents. And I, I think any successful program has to be involving everybody that's key to the child's life, both the parents and the, and the teachers, in this case, in school. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, Sonia, uh, I know the school your child attends has a, has a similar project that, that you've talked about, The Sky's the Limit, which has become established in response to a need in your school community. Can you tell us how this service has worked for and impacted you and your child? Um, as I stated, when he first started school, his behaviours and everything were, they were challenging. And I was being pushed from pillar to post from when he was in preschool. They couldn't cope with his behaviours and I was told to take him home and you deal with him and you know so when I got him into Corpus Christi school I had a chat with the principal and I said look I'm worried about his behaviours and I just can't cope and a couple of weeks months later I give birth to twins so it was like more stress on top of more stress and I can remember I went to the school one day and the previous day he was five and a half and he told me he wanted to kill himself. And I didn't know how to cope with it. I got frightened. I said, you should not know anything about killing yourself. Um, so I went to the principal and I started crying into his face. And I said, look, I don't know if it's I'm doing wrong or something. Is he getting jealous of the twins? Or It was just a mix of emotions. So he said, 
will you meet with Declan? That was the psychologist from University of Limerick. So I said I would. So Declan explained that he was setting up a parent group and that it would teach us about our kids' behaviours, why they happen, when they happen, how they happen, how to deal with them. Um, if you become overwhelmed by it, how you deal with your own emotions. So it wasn't just about the child, it was also about myself and my partner. So we went, um, and it was over the course of a few weeks that it was the realisation that, yeah, it was his behaviours, but I didn't know how to deal with it. And I needed training because I didn't have the services in place that... I could have had if he was under, say, Enable Ireland or something like that, where they trained the parent to deal with their kids. So I hadn't been under any service as of yet with him. And so we learned all of that and we were sent away and told work on it week by week and then come back once a week and see if there is progress. So that's what we did. And we did see a huge difference with him. And the huge difference in him meant a huge difference in me and a huge difference in the family overall. We weren't as stressed as what we were a few weeks previous. Um, now, all his little behaviours didn't magically disappear. It doesn't happen like that. But we pinpointed what the need was, how to deal with it, and how to get better outcomes for everyone involved. So... From that, the programme just got bigger. It just became, the need was there for everyone. Occupational therapy, speech and language, dietetics, music therapy, play therapy. There's adult counselling, child counselling. Like when I went to Corpus Christi in sixth class in 2003, my father had just been murdered as part of the feud in Limerick. And I was put into Rainbows Club, and I thought that was a great help. I had my counselling services, whereas my siblings who were in secondary school didn't have anything. And it's now that that reflection is happening. I had a sister last year who had a breakdown. She was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder because she didn't get the help she needed when she was younger. And now that her children are attending Corpus Christi, she's now getting the adult counselling that she should have got when she was 14. But I had got it when I was 11, so I had the mechanisms to cope. I was taught how to cope with this. And she could never speak about my father. She wouldn't hang pictures of him up, and we all thought it was just weird. But she just couldn't do it because she wasn't learned how to cope with a debt. So in Corpus Christi School, it's this one? Yeah, yeah this one. I'm in the area of my Ross for years, as many would have saw in the papers, it was rife with criminality, drug addiction, alcohol, domestic violence, you name it, high, school, high levels of early school leavers, young mothers, lone parents, um, like it was just statistic after st statistic. But like you'd have kids that would go to school and there could be a dead body in a car outside the school. Someone could have been shot the night before. Um, someone could have died of addiction in a house where there was overcrowding. They could have been sleeping in the same bed. Do you know, it was, it was a whole amount of things. And these kids were getting up, going to school, book on front of them. Now it's time to learn. You leave that at home. And the principal and the teachers just knew that wasn't right. They shouldn't have to come to school after seeing someone next to him in a bed dead from maybe an overdose or, as Sarah said, suicide or, like, if a family member had been murdered, how do you expect them to go back in and learn, learn, learn straight away? You know, it's not just about the education. It's about emotions. It's about people's mental health. And if you can stop and deal with the trauma and the hurt and the emotions there and then, well, then you're helping to stop the suicides, the addictions, the alcoholism 20 years down the line, the post-traumatic stress disorders that should have been dealt with 20 years previous. So 
in the school, every child, their needs are assessed. Um, and as you said, it's a whole school approach. It's teachers, assistant psychologists, everyone feeds in and gives their input on these children. Um, then they link in with Enable Ireland. There's students that come in from the University of Limerick. This started during COVID where they would carry out the therapies with the kids because there was such a big waiting list for these therapies. And then you had parents who couldn't financially provide for a taxi service to these services outside of the community. So the do not attends were rising. And now that they're in the school, they've seen a big, big increase in attendances because the kids are only coming from down the corridor and mammy's only around the con or our dad's working for the CE scheme next door, you know? So everyone is around. Um, and it is a whole community approach. It's like, they helped me go back to college. I would have never went back without the help and support from everyone in the school. So it's not just the primary school, even though that's where it starts. Like Sarah said, it's a transition of, you take the kids from sixth class into first year, you help them with the overwhelming feelings around that. And that's where that will help parents as well because my own little boy is going into sixth class in September. So he has to get ready for secondary school. And I'm already panicking because he'll forget his books, he'll forget his biros, he'll forget. <laughs> and I feel as if I'll be the worst parent in the world if I get a phone call to say, little Johnny didn't have his notepad today, do you know? And I said, well, it was in his bag yesterday. It's somewhere. <laughs> but they will learn them how to cope with the stresses and everything of that. So it is carried through into secondary school as well. That's, that's fantastic. Thank you, Sonia. And if there was an example of how early intervention can, in comparison for your, you and your sister's experience, yeah. You really did show that very literally in yeah. that situation. So I think, you know, thank and you. And it only sharing. came to me last year because yeah. when I used to go to Rainbow Club, I used to have an hour out of class. Yeah. I've gone out the door, <laughs> you know, yeah. take the book and out. <laughs> but it was when last year something had happened in the family and it was like it impacted us all. But we all dealt differently with it. And as Coleman said, you build up res resilience. And I was like, right, we'll deal with this now head on. And she couldn't. Mm. She just, she had in the heart. Mm. And it was going back to us, she was looking for that caregiver that would normally help her to do things. Mm. But he wasn't there. Mm. Thank, you, you know? thank, thank you very much. And just, just for people here, one of the stands that we have out today is Rainbows. So if people want to know more about that service, um, we're there. Uh, so moving on then to Louise. Um, Louise, St. Patrick's Mental Health Service as an inpatient adolescent mental health unit, and your services see young people who are impacted with significant challenges to their mental health. With this in mind, can you explain why St. Patrick's Mental Health Service has decided to engage in part to partner in partnership with MPC to campaign for mental health supports in primary school? And what potential do you see for such services, specifically in relation to children and to future planning for Ireland's child and adolescent mental health services? I can leave there's answer a question. Lot, there's a lot. <laughs> I can't believe I wrote that all down in one question. I feel faint. <laughs> Do your best. It's, okay. But this seems extra loud now as well. Um, so, yeah, so St. Patrick's Mental Health Service as well as um, pr primarily being a service provider, we would see advocacy as a, a pillar, an important pillar of the work we do. Um, and a core focus of that would be uh, around the the right of the child to the highest attainable standard of mental health. So we do a lot of work, um, primarily through our Walk on My Shoes program around mental health education and awareness um, programs, a lot focused on schools. Um, and we already partner with the, the National Parents Council um, on a, a mental health awareness module for parents, um, which uh, Anya mentioned earlier. But we'd also um, advocate for um, the need to strengthen services and legislation, for example, and um, uh, 
this model that Sarah has outlined is, is such an innovative and effective example of a way to strength, meaningfully strengthen um, mental health supports for children and young people. Um, so we're happy to partner with the National Parents Council on, on an advocacy campaign around that. Um, in terms of the second half of the question, <laughs> um, so, you know, as has been outlined very clearly through all the presentations and all the, the points made, um, we know that early intervention um, and meeting young people and children where they're at, when they need the help, is the most effective way to, to get in positive outcomes for um, young people's mental health. Um, but we also know that um, CAMS, um, we, we see headlines about CAMS waiting lists all the time and um, also primary care psychological services, which I believe is an even longer waiting list than, than um, the tertiary services. Well, we don't want young people and children to be getting to the point, or so many children and young people to get to the point where they need to access specialist services. Um, which Coleman uh, really articulately outlined earlier. Um, and, you know, we see from the outcomes shared by Sarah and by other, um, other even lower level services in secondary schools in Wales, for example, where counselling services have been provided and 90% of the 11,000 young people who access them did not need referral on to other services. We see how it can um, remove the need for more acute service provision. So that's really important. Um, and so it'll take pressure off, off CAMS in the longer term, but I think more importantly, it'll benefit children's uh, and young people's mental health and wellbeing. Um, we know that, um, as Coleman mentioned, the majority of adult mental health difficulties or disorders emerge in childhood. Um, and as Sonia very generously shared her, her family experiences, the impact of early intervention um, can really make a difference or conversely can, can lead to a deterioration of mental health and a more severe presentation at later life. So um, it's, it's another benefit really to, this, to, this, to a model like this to, um, to stop mental health difficulties that emerge in childhood persisting into adulthood. Um, so yeah. So there are my thoughts. Thanks very much. Thank you. You did a fine job of my com very complicated. Did I cover question. all the bits? You did. I think you did. Yes. <laughs> the subsections. So, so we're just going to finish uh, with uh, these. These chairs are on wheels, and every time I move, <laughs> I, I go. Um, but uh, we're just going to f to finish with uh, the same question for all panel men members, and I suppose it's that bit of a call to action. So, what what is your message to government policymakers and those that have influence in relation to young children's mental health in Ireland? And I might start with James. Is that okay? Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Anya. Um, so, I suppose my my first message would be to ask all of us, um, include to to think a little bit about. Um, how we talk about schools and the response to mental health. Uh, UNESCO now is, is preferring to use the term whole education approach rather than whole school approach because the whole school approach kind of implies that you have to find all the solutions in your school. Um, but everyone today has been talking about those connections with the community but also the wider education system and not this distant role of government and you know who fund the schools but they, they have to be part of the solution. Um, and part of the response to uh, to um, support good mental health among among children. So let's start talking about a whole education approach, and then that means we're all part of the solution, not just the local school asking for help. Um, I'm really interested again in the EMHPs. If all we got out of um, the government was EMHPs um, in schools, I think that could really, really make a big difference. Um, and I also am really interested that they come from a mix of um, different professional backgrounds. When we talked about the culture of schools and the culture of teaching professional earlier on, having people come into schools from other backgrounds is the, mo is the single most important way to change the culture. They bring a new perspective and um, they bring new skills and new insights that will ultimately benefit the mental health of the, of the children in the school. And then the last thing is in all of this, 
um, it, it, Coleman referred to it earlier on as the voice and the agency of the child and we're not really good on that and I think in planning for mental health pr provision in our schools we need to listen to what children are saying so just to give you an example of that um, in, the, in the field of bullying um, studies we're now um, looking at defining bullying differently up to now we've defined it very much in terms of behaviour so the behaviour would be um, traditionally defined as aggressive negative acts, repeated over time, intentional and a power imbalance. So if one of those four things doesn't exist, then we say, oh, bullying, it doesn't exist, sorry, nothing I can do about it. But actually what we're doing now is we're talking more about um, the experience of harm and the impact of that on mental health. So if we flip it and if we listen to the child and give them voice and agency, they don't talk about repeated negative acts. And what they talk about how they feel. They talk about the harm they, that, that it does to them, to their friends and to their community. And so I think we need to listen more to children if we're to have an appropriate response and we need to have mechanisms for that. It can't be tokenistic. We need to put in place as part of a whole education approach mechanisms to listen to children and hear what their needs are in relation to mental health. And that's a job for all of us. I'm after looking at Joe and Fair. So, what is your message to government policy makers and those that have influence in relation to young children's mental health in Ireland? Um, across the board, all departments should be worried about it and all departments should put their hands in their pockets and help. It's not just the Department of Education or the Department of Health or whatever. It's all departments because it's our kids, it's the future of Ireland that is in their hands. And when I see the work that is done in Corpus Christi, just that small little bit of help can really make a difference in the kids. And like the fundraising for that type of stuff that you need, it is hard and I've taken part in it. And you have to go and bear your soul to someone that you don't know. And I have done it because it will help my kids. And I will do whatever it takes to help my children. And if that means that I have to go up and tell my story to someone for money, I will. Um, so I think it is the department. They should be funding it. It shouldn't be up to parents to go out and lay their soul on the table just for help for their kids. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> you keep getting the cats on you. Yeah, so, so um, next Wednesday, we, myself and John and our colleagues probably will meet about 120, 125 TDs and senators. Uh, so I, I told you before um, that we have difficulty uh, having influence on other departments. That's our chance that day. We, ha we haven't had it during COVID. Um, we, we had it for a number of years before that. So we'll be speaking to all those politicians um, and I'm, I'm going to tell you the message we're going to be bringing to them about children's mental health just now in a moment. But um, that's like a kickstart for us as an organisation on Wednesday and then the school holidays come. And then September time, uh, we replicate that in every Dáil constituency uh, before the budget. We get teachers in every single constituency to meet all TDs and senators to try to influence um, greater spending on education in the budget. And we're fairly good at what we do in that regard. But imagine if um, the 546,000 children, uh, that their parents decided to do the same before the budget, that they decided to back the INTO and the NPC's campaign for um, support for children's mental health, and if we just made one big effort this year to try to get this over the line. So I, I suppose the Irish context um, is that one third of children in primary school have experienced mental health difficulties by the age of 13. Um, that during COVID there was 40% more uh, referrals to CAMS and other services. Um, that we um, obviously are deploring the lack of access that children have to mental health services at community and school level, particularly at school level, it's not really there. Um, we recognise that there's challenges encountered by children on the autistic spectrum, but not only children on the autistic spectrum, and there's a lot of difficulties with 
provision for, for children with autism still in Ireland. Um, you know, there's huge professionalism shown by um, education staff, SNAs, teachers, school secretaries and caretakers were even mentioned. Um, but you know, there's, there's a pilot scheme running for the last few years um, on um, the school inclusion model. Um, it's only happening in some Wicklow schools, some Kildare schools and some South Dublin schools. It's been running for a couple of years. It was supposed to be expanded to all of Ireland. Um, I believe that the children in all of Ireland have the same entitlement to be getting a bit of occupational health therapy and any other helps that are needed as the children in, in that particular part of the country. So um, three or four years of a pilot scheme, when you see what can be achieved in South West England with, um, you know, everybody obviously was on board with that programme. But here things are so slow. Um, so we would be demanding that age appropriate supports are, uh, are available for children presenting with mental health uh, difficulties to deal with their ongo ongoing needs. There's 225 NEP psychologists, and that's one for every 18 schools. Um, even to get an extra 20 NEP psychologists cost about 1.5 million. Um, that's our National Educational Psychological Service. We have only 225 for the whole country. Um, obviously, the, the Early Years Therapy Support Demonstration Project uh, needs to be expanded. Um, we need recruitment of, of the specialist staff, and the government has to develop a national framework. Now, obviously, what we're trying to do as an organisation is only to try to move this thing forward you know, a small step. Because if we were to get that budget of that 20 euro per child uh, to allow the school to have the autonomy to try to bring in the supports uh, that suit that school best, well then, if it was only run for a couple of years and if, if, there was, if it was analysed, it might be that it would lead to the type of programme that's you know, obviously more centralised and, and uh, funded by government. So I think it's really important this... Um, meeting that we're having this conference here today, but I, I just want to take the opportunity to, to I suppose, um, urge parents as well to try to get behind this because, um, you know, we, we have heard the difficulties when a family didn't get the supports that they needed early on. And in order for us to ensure that the like of that doesn't happen into the future, we just need to make sure that whatever department funds it, that the money goes in early and that there's cross-departmental supports put in and that all, there's, all the different organisations are involved in joined up thinking. So if we, if we can come out of this conference, um, sort of every one of us here determined to see that this conference here is only the start of the conversation and that we can try and get action from government, I think it'll be a, a day very, very well spent. So thanks very much thanks, for the invitation, John. Anya. Thanks. Um, well, I would, one thing that's coming up um, that I think is relevant is that Ireland will be reviewed by the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child in January. And at our last review, which I think was 2016, um, some of the issues that have come up today were, were raised by, so a state delegation goes over and is um, in, inter, interrogated sort of by um, a committee and um, issues that were flagged around children's mental health were um, you know, access difficulties, long waiting lists, continued admissions of under 18s to adult units, and a need for, um, for more investment in quality and capacity of mental health services. So my message would be what's going to be different in January, what's going to be different this time in terms of our obligations to um, the rights of our children? and uh, why not see it as an opportunity to demonstrate real ambition and a real commitment to um, investing in children's mental health in Ireland. Thank you, Louise. And I'd just like to thank Louise, James, Sonia and John. And if we could just give them one last round of applause for our great panel. Thank you very much.
Now, from where I'm sitting, I can start to smell the lunch. So I just, if you could bear with us a little bit longer, because I'm sure everybody's getting very hungry. And before I hand over to John Driscoll, who's the president of the INTO, just to close out this morning's session, um, I just want to give you a little bit of an indication this afternoon what's going to happen. So as you leave the um, auditorium now, you're going to be given a, a sheet of paper um, maybe even two sheets of paper. I'm not quite sure how it's being two. I'm being told from the back. And the, se the, the, the speakers this afternoon are going to have question and answer sessions afterwards. So to maximise the amount of questions we get, we can get through, we ask you to put your questions on those sheets and in a box outside. So the two speakers we have this afternoon is we're going to have Sarah again. As Sarah indicated this morning, she's actually going to do a session that they would do in the UK for parents that help parents support their children's anxiety. So if you've got questions that you would like to ask Sarah, you can write it down in the box, in the paper, put it in the box, and then we can go through as many of those questions. Sometimes that can feel a little bit awkward because you haven't heard her speak yet. But just if you've got questions around that general topic, the reason we do it is because we know we get through a lot more questions and it becomes a lot more useful for everybody in that way. 